Good morning, everybody. I don't know about you guys, but I, I've been awake for hours. So, um, <coughs> so um, today we're going to talk about everybody's favorite topic, which is computer security. And um, for all the investigative journalists there in the room, I know this is old hat for you. Um, but for some of the technical people that want to dig in, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to have some useful conversations. Um, we're really lucky because, as it just so happens, we have basically three of the really great minds um, representing three really great projects that are kind of on the cutting edge, I would say, of endpoint user security in the what I would call free software or free and open source software communities. So I'm going to let each person introduce themselves because I can't keep all of their anonymous nicknames. Um, you know, straight, and I don't want to accidentally out anybody for something, and even though I know each person individually, um, I don't actually remember how to say their names out loud compared to reading them on a computer screen. So um, if you could introduce yourself and uh, give a brief uh, statement about your project, um, I think you have uh, three minutes per, um, that would be really fantastic. Cool. So hey, um, I work on the Tails project. Um, and I'm just one of the many Tails de developers around in the world. I'm just, you know, just one of those people who actually like do the talking, and there's a lot of people actually working elsewhere. Um, so Tails is a live system, and we've been around for a couple of years. Um, namely, we've been around for a couple of years because we learned from um, the previous failures of the hardened and reasonably secure operating systems that have been out there. Um, many of them, uh, I think, uh, you know, why we have seen them kind of like d disappear after a while is because it's really hard work to maintain a system like this. You're basically creating an entire operating system. And it's just not the coding work that, that makes it hard to maintain. It's the documentation, it's the support requests, it's dealing with security issues, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, TILS is kind of the result of that because we learned from those mistakes. It's a merge of two different projects, um, one called Incognito and the other one called Amnesia. And we made that into Tails. Um, and we've been around for a couple of years uh, by now. Um, basically, what it does is that you, know, you put it on a USB stick or an SD card. Um, uh, you plug it into your computer. You boot it. You do your secret stuff. You shut it down. And it should leave no trace of what has happened on the machine or any documents you've been working on or any videos you've been editing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and our core network um, infrastructure is using Tor. So every, every kind of traffic, like email, um, but also web browsing, goes over Tor. And we think this is adding um, an, an extra security layer and making it harder for uh, you know, the adversaries in the world to target a specific, um, uh, specifically you. Um, and, and we try to make this thing as usable um, um, as possible, because we believe that usable security is part of creating a good system. Um, and then, you know, next to that, um, you know, both Subgraph and, and like uh, Tails are based on a free software operating system called Debian, um, with you know other projects like Wunix and Crypto and other um, privacy-aware security projects um, are using. Um, next to that, you know, we get funded through the donations and government funding, indirectly government funding. So you know, we, we, we get money from uh, philanthropic NGOs, um, uh, and we don't have a legal entity uh, because we don't want to be coerced, you know, targeted to uh, you know, write a backdoor, which we would never do. Great. Thank you. And All right. Is there supposed to be a beat? Uh, well, I guess everybody knows David from his hip hop uh, from last night. Um, I, um. So, yeah, so um, you guys already know a little bit. Some of you, if you were here yesterday, know a little bit about our project, so I'll try to keep it short. Uh, we're a team of four. I'm very lucky to be here with, with the rest of my team, including the illustrator who, uh, who drew the, the cool thing about Subgraph. Um, Subgraph is a was inspired by Tails, actually. Uh, but we wanted something that you could install and use over a 
prolonged period of time to work and communicate. So that was sort of the origin of Subgraph, and because we're security people, uh, we had a lot of ideas for how we could make this desktop operating system uh, more resistant to the types of exploits that are being used to compromise people on the internet. Uh, we think that we've, ha we've added some really good uh, security protections, uh, such as uh, strengthened kernel. Uh, I don't want to get technical, but we've done a lot of things to really make a secure endpoint desktop operating system uh, that doesn't exist yet anywhere else. Um, what else? Um, we, are, we are a team of software developers and designers and illustrators, and our objective really here is to create a holistic experience. So one example I like to give about the things we do is uh, there's, a, there's an instant messenger client, a chat client, that, that is being developed as a replacement uh, to the less secure versions by Ola Bini, he's somewhere here, and his brilliant team. So we, you know, we'll work on that, or we'll, we built a, an application firewall. We'll do things, we'll create things that don't exist to, to, to have this holistic user experience that we want that is secure. So that's Subgraph OS. Um, hello, I'm, I'm for a CubeOS project. <coughs> a CubeOS is, we have started this project um, almost six years ago, and unlike other approaches to security, we, we do not try to improve the existing, um, what we believe, insecure systems. Rather, we decided to take a quite radical approach, and we decided first to almost destroy everything, and then using compartmentalization, so isolation. Uh, we essentially decided to isolate everything from, from everything with the idea that whatever can get compromised, whether it's your application, like a web browser, or maybe it's your Wi-Fi driver, Wi-Fi card, because you are using unsecure Wi-Fi in your hotel or airport lounge, or whether it's part of the kernel because you plugged in USB device. All these things have been put into separate compartments. <coughs> and um, that sounds pretty obvious and, and pretty straightforward. However, we, have, we then faced a problem that, okay, we have maybe 15 compartments, but at the end of the day, this is a personal computer. So there is one user doing essentially one coherent workflow there. So now, so, so now we face the problem how to actually integrate this back into something usable for a, as a personal uh, operating system. And uh, that's obviously tricky because how to do this without destroying the isolation. Um, so I guess this mostly describes our, our approach. It's, it's very paranoid. We, we consider all sorts of threat models from uh, remote attacks, like opening PDF or email attachment, like David said, they do with Subgraph, but we also extend it to all sorts of other threat models that other projects do not account for, like malicious USB devices, malicious uh, Bluetooth devices, malicious Wi-Fi networks, all sorts of stuff. And, and uh, as you can see, it's quite of a challenge to do it uh, in, a, in a way that is the user experience is preserved. That's Cube's OS. Thank you, guys. All right. So we, I think, are, we're hopeful that we'll be able to take questions. And I wonder, you know, depending on the mix of the audience, I'm a little bit curious just to do a little survey now. We're not going to take questions now. But who here, if you would have a question, would you raise your hand just so we could sort of get an idea about the, the number of people that will have questions? So we have at least three over there. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so I think 20 minutes for Q&A in a little while will probably be good, and we're, uh, hopefully you can fight to the death uh, over those mic slots to ensure that you get your question answered first. Um, but we want to start um, just kind of a little bit of, uh, I'm, I'm not going to actually get too involved in the moderation here. Um, these guys have very different, I would say very different approaches 
um, but very similar goals in mind. And so we wanted to start off by talking about a thing we call threat modeling or safety planning in the domestic violence world or compartmentalization. There's lots of different ways to think about it, but just trying to imagine what risks you may face or, for example, if you're an investigative journalist, maybe you're not worried about malicious USB devices, but you are worried about exploitation by email attachment, or maybe if you're an investigative journalist, you don't understand what I just said. It's unclear. <laughs> And so the concept of threat modeling is a little bit strange if the second part of what I said applies. Um, but nonetheless, they each have a different approach to this problem. And this is an absolutely critical thing for people to understand which project to use. And it may be obvious that the answer is you should use all three in different situations. But you have to decide what it is you actually want to do. And so I'm hopeful that you guys could sort of discuss amongst yourselves for about five minutes maybe what, what you think users need to think about with regard to threat modeling. I just have a quick comment. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, even though, um, well, let's leave Tails for a moment aside because Tails has radically different use model. But if, we, if you compare our two projects, SubgraphOS and CubesOS, which have different approaches, it's not like you can use either of them. It's you could, have two, you could it's, have two computers. Sure, but it's, it's possible that you can, uh, what I meant to say is you don't have to decide. Ideally, our two projects could merge and we could use subgraph uh, anti-exploitation technology in our Cubes VMs. It's perfectly possible. The only reason we don't do that is that first, subgraph has just been launched and, and second, we just need more resources to, to have a port for Cubes OS. So I just wanted to stress it's not just two things. The, the, the more interesting question is how Tails could fit into this question, uh, into this picture, because Tails has different use models. So. Right, so I think we should consider um, a few things here. Um, one of them is, um, even though Tails doesn't use the latest, greatest, um, uh, you know, most sexiest uh, anti-exploitation uh, methods out there, um, we have seen in, you know, and I'm not saying, and we've seen attacks, um, uh, that it still had been very hard for certain intelligence agencies to like compromise these machines. Um, one of them is, and uh, you know, it's because you know we are based on amnesia, and probably if you're being hunted by an intelligence agency, um, uh, you know, it tails is not going to save your life in the end, right? Um, because probably what they will do is they will try to implant something, um, uh, you know, they will try to compromise your Tails machine and then try to compromise the hardware, right? So that is like the same thing for all of our projects. And it might, um, and I think the important thing here is that, you know, security is like an economics process. And I, I, when you make it harder to compromise a certain machine, you win something. And I think that is the most important thing. But how do you establish, you know, the facts, uh, what kind of like what kind of you know operating system you should use? Um, and that is, you know, I mean, that's a hard problem, right? Um, so how do we so how do we make that easier for the user? Because this is something that is a question for all of, for all three of us, um, and that is kind of an open-ended question, actually. Um, but threat modeling is super hard for people. Um. Yeah, tr threat modeling is generally hard for everybody because uh, it's, we often hear somebody saying something like, but this solution is good enough. It's very, very, very debatable uh, statement usually. Um, Yeah, one aspect that might not be clear to the audience here is that um, in case of CubeOS, an important obstacle for people to use it is hardware, income, hardware, hardware requirements. In other words, it's very hard to get, maybe not very hard, but not easy to get a laptop that runs CubeOS as well, because Cubes uses uh, all sorts of new technologies for isolation. Uh, and it requires, and, and these technologies, because they are not used by other operating systems, they are not so well tested, so even if the processor supports them, 
the laptop might just not support them because the BIOS vendor decided not to support them well, whatever. So that's what the two other projects offer, where they offer an advantage is that you can easily run them on essentially any hardware. And that's as I understand, one of the main goals of Tails is to be able to run it on any hardware. Right, yeah. That's not happening with cubes. Right. On cubes you need to have special, uh, more powerful laptop to run it. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the goals of, of the Subgraph project too. Like, um, like, like Tails, we use, we, we offer compartmentalization similar in concept to cubes. It differs entirely um, the, tech, the technology basis. But it, the, the, the compartmentalization features that isolate one application from another so that if your email client gets compromised, um, it, you know, the, the, the thing that enters your computer will have a much more difficult time infecting the rest of your system or grabbing your files. Um, this is lightweight um, resource-wise. Uh, one of my test machines is a six or seven-year-old netbook uh, with four gigs of RAM and it runs Subgraph OS perfectly. And this is something we admire about the, the Tails project because the people who need more secure endpoints have the computers that they have and this is what we have to work with. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's a practical objective to, to aim for. Okay, but let me just clarify that. Uh, while you might be using lightweight compartmentalization, this is a completely different thing than the compartmentalization that we use on Cubes OS because your compartmentalization is just for the user applications. Our compartmentalization is for essentially all parts of the operating system. And exactly because of this, because we extend this compartmentalization not just to protect applications, but also your, your operating systems from attacks such as those coming from untrusted USB devices or, or uh, Wi-Fi networks or whatever. Exactly because of this, we need to pay the price of, of poorer, of, of much worse hardware compatibility. Because it's easy to do compartmentalization for user land, for, for applications, it's much harder to do it for the rest of the operating system. So just to make sure, compartmentalization could be that could be different compartmentalization levels. So Joanna, maybe maybe just to jump in here, maybe it would make sense to talk about this. Uh, when you asked about threat modeling earlier before we started the panel, there was this discussion of how we might apply it to anyone in the audience that didn't understand the last five minutes of the discussion. And that's, I would guess, half of the audience from that. So the question, I guess, I, and that's a low estimate, I think. Um, you're talking about compartments with regard to physicality. For those of you that were following along with that, I think that's obvious, but it might not be obvious. It's pretty reasonable. So if you imagine you have a computer, which is a brand new computer, and you left it in your hotel room. Anybody here do that? You're, you guys are just fucking lying to us. Okay, you did, great, all right. One person was brave enough to be honest. Also. Okay, great. So two people <laughs> leaving that there, and the rest of you are lying to us. I uh, appreciate that very much. But so that would be an example of a differentiation between cubes and I would actually say subgraph and tails, where the tails guys and girls and others that are involved with the project, I would expect them to have a USB disk around there. Do you have a USB disk around your neck? Maybe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Right? Okay. Um, the subgraph guys I would expect to carry a laptop. Are you carrying your laptop? Yeah, it's, it's been with me the whole time. You're carrying a laptop with you? Okay. And you left it in the hotel room. Okay. So what happened about this Evil Maze research you did like a couple of years ago? Uh, well, she left her laptop in the hotel room. That means that she solved the problem. <laughs> and we're all happy to hear that. So this would be a way to think about this project, which is that He's, for example, using Tails by keeping the disk with him, which is his trusted operating system, and he just plugs it into any computer. Very promiscuous computer user. If you, if you, know, you just like plug it in and, and you go. And as long as it's the, the computer, it's okay. You know, it's your computer. It's or David, let you have access to his computer, and you've got all your data with you, or you don't have any data. You just needed access to a computer with a trusted set of tools, where David's 
project or subgraphs project is essentially about taking any computer you might have and then making it much harder to exploit, where what you're re really worried about is internet exploitation. I mean, probably if you're an investigative journalist, you care just about exploitation overall, but this is a very focused part of that and, and, and stopping that exploitation. So if you're worried you do investigations on Egypt, for example, um, using subgraph would be great if you're not worried about the Egyptian intelligence service coming to your house. Right? You're, you're worried about them coming to your house through the computer, through the internet. And Jana's project, if we were to differentiate that, is the project which you install on your laptop before you go to like a, like a crazy surveillance state like China, America, and you, would, um, and you would feel safe leaving it in your hotel room, for example. Just as like a clear delineation. Now, there's lots of technical details that blur these lines, and it's actually significantly different than that, right? Joanna's Project Cubes has these features where you can turn on an entire operating system, inside of your operating system. You know, you've probably seen the internet meme, yo dog, I heard you liked operating systems, so I put an operating system in your operating system so you can operate that system inside of your operating system. That's Cubes, basically. And and, and subgraph is obviously not designed for that. It's designed to be stateful but compartmentalized. And then tails, again, is designed to be stateless. And we all want to be without a state, so that seems like a good goal. And that's a clear delineation which you can clearly have threats, and you can imagine those threats and map them, for example, to physical surveillance activities. You can map them to your own behavioral economics, where you will decide I'm willing to leave my laptop in the hotel room. Apparently, none of you have that problem, which is a lie. But obviously, the subgraph and the tails operating system, they operate somewhat differently. If you don't want to carry a USB disk around on your neck or think about it that way, you might just imagine, just in those behavioral senses, a way to differentiate these projects. Um, but I actually want to throw a curveball at you guys, because I think there's an unstated problem in the free software community, and that's US government funding. And I want to talk about sustainability of projects and how the US government's imperialism on the internet funding front um, infiltrates every project everywhere. I work on the, the Tor project. I'm not here as a Tor person today, but um, we get funding from the US government. And this is a question people always ask me. And I both love it and I hate it. I, I hate it because there are no good answers to sustainability with free software at times. And then also I love it because People really should be asking this question. Is there, and this is the question, is there such a thing as funding that doesn't come with strings attached? Can you take money from DARPA, whose mission is to kill people more effectively, or from the State Department, whose mission is to whitewash DARPA's killing, for example? Um, can you do that? And if so, how does your project do that if you take government money, directly or indirectly, obviously? You know, if you have some complicated money laundering process, don't talk about it here on stage, obviously. <laughs> but, but I wonder if you could just talk about that as another differentiation for threat models, because, you know, maybe I don't trust the U.S. government, maybe I do. I mean, obviously, I trust the U.S. government. Who, who wouldn't trust them, right? They've got all of our best interests in mind. So maybe we could start with you to talk about funding, and then we can move back this direction. A yep. couple minutes each. Well, it's, um, well, generally it's, it's believed that open source projects, because everybody can see the, uh, the source code for it, uh, should be more difficult to plant a backdoor. So <clears throat> uh, this is theory, also, of course, because uh, then we create the actual programs by the process of compiling the software which produces binary code, which is much more difficult to look at and which might, uh, there are higher chances that it contains backdoors. So uh, there is some efforts among all of us to, to move towards what, what is called reproducible, reproducible builds, uh, which is a way to make sure that this machine code that is produced is going to be the same for the same source code. And this is exactly an effort to make sure that uh, it would be more difficult to, to plant backdoors in open source projects. Um, other than that, it's, it's really, it's really um, just trusting developers um, there's not really a good solution to that problem. But with um, regard to funding, does Cubes take, for example, 
funding from the U.S. government? And yeah, if so, do. is there a future business model? Is there a sustainability or cooperative model of crowdfunding? Yeah, we, we, we are funded by Open Technology Fund uh, recently. Um, of course, this does not affect our uh, trustworthiness, at least so I say. Whether you believe me or not, this is up to you. Uh, it's really hard to make a good business model for an open source project, of course. Um, so I guess it's an open question, the sustainability of this. So all, all three of our projects are funded by the Open Technology Fund, by the way. We, we, all, we all get the same money uh, right now. So I, I can offer a really cheap shot, easy answer, which is I'd rather have them spend money on free software developers than buy bullets and bombs and stuff. But but that doesn't, add, that doesn't address the fundamental issue. Um, we're not asked to put back doors in. They're actually really cool. And like Joanna said, uh, the, the, the concept of reproducible builds lets, you, lets anyone in the world ensure you know, with certainty that the source code that we put online corresponds to what gets distributed and gets used by people. That's what reproducible builds is for. It's, it's beyond the concept of open source. Open source is not enough. Subgraph is a six-year-old legal entity. We're a Canadian, we're structured as a Canadian corporation. Uh, we've self-funded ourselves for all those years, except for the last one, by doing security consulting. Um, and we intend to continue doing whatever it takes to fund the project, including commercializing, perhaps, parts of Subgraph OS. Um, without compromising uh, the, the project and the users who depend on it. Like, i.e., I mean, it will always be freely available. So, so yeah, we intend to, to not be funded, to, to not rely on, on grants from anybody, because I, I do not think that, that, that there is money without strings attached from, you know, in, in the form of grants. Right, so yeah, like David said, we are also funded indirectly by you know, the US government um, through the Open Technology Fund. Um, and I echo, you know, I'd rather have them spend money on free and open source software than uh, having uh, them you know, do research on like, drones, for example. Um, however, yeah, like, that doesn't address the fundamental issue. And I think what is important here is that, you know, and I kind of address the journalists in the room here, it's like, what happens is that, you know, you pay for your Microsoft license, you pay for your Mac OS X license, you pay for your Adobe Photoshop license. Um, why wouldn't you donate, uh, you know, free to free and open source projects, like, you know, the, to the people who are on stage right now or the people who are working around the world? Because it helps ensure that these projects can exist so you can do your reporting from those machines. And this is, partially a responsibility for our users um, to say, we, would, we like what you do, and we would like to support you. Um, so this is something we've been trying to experiment with, um, and, and we want to experiment with more and say, if you like Tails, and we're looking for ways to kind of do this through crowdfunding or like, you know, to set up like a yearly donation thing um, to help us not rely as much on government funding because we really like to be funded by the community of people who we have around us. Um, and that is something you know, we'd like to start working towards in the next couple of years. Can I say one more thing? Yep. So in my opinion, the biggest issue with US, say US government funding is that our users who need our stuff don't trust the US government. And this funding taints, it taints us. It, it makes us, it, it casts doubt and mistrust on our projects, which is, which is bad because then the users who need our stuff won't use it. So that's the biggest problem in my, in my opinion. Um, and I'm gonna speak just about Cubes and Subgraph because we're a little bit, like our projects are kind of similar in how we're structured. What we're creating has value to people and I believe that people will, you know, co corporations will, will pay for adversary resistant computing. They need it too. And this can, this can support our projects. So um, just so we'll have time for q and I wanted to also ask uh, a question which I think a few people here have asked me this question. They asked me about Tor, but they've actually also asked me about each of your projects. Um, and the number one question that I've received from rando strangers that also like follow me around asking me about airplane mode on cell phones 
um, for example, um, is it's an interesting question where there's just some trust that's required. And I trust that since you're being filmed and that we know each other, you'll be honest about this. And, and I think it's good, um, pretty reasonable. And, and since we can't really get into too many of the technical details, we really have to rely on trust. And I wonder if any of you guys have been approached by secret services or by police and what your commitment is, for example, to not having back doors, um, to like actually not okay, just reproducibility, okay. reproducible okay. builds or something, but if you have had this experience, sure. because I know that a number of people in the community have actually been approached, and I don't know about you guys, but I know other people that have, and they've made explicit statements. And so if your project has a, a, has a commitment to not having back doors, if you would say that, and if you've had any other approaches, that would be great to hear. So we publish a uh, warrant camera every three months. Um, which is digitally signed by, by key developers of KubesOS, including myself. Uh, and the statements there state exactly that, that, that we have not been asked to do any, back, that we have not built in, in any, any backdoors in Cubes. Has, has that, but, but just to clarify that, has anyone ever asked you to do that? Regardless, of, you obviously wouldn't do it. That's your warrant canary commitment. Mm -hmm. But has anyone even tried to approach you? Um, no, nobody tried to approach me personally, I can talk for myself obviously only. Uh, the question is, we, we are getting uh, lots of contributions from the community in, and some of the commits or pull requests we are getting uh, are get uh, rejected or are be, we ask people to rewrite them because some of them actually might be considered like a weakening. That's, that's another problem. <coughs> That, that our open source project face. Because normally when you think open source, this is like, this is so great. Thousands of people from all sorts of part of the world contribute, so the growth is exponential. <clears throat> but the problem that at least uh, we have in Cubes is that we need to review every, every of this contribution to make sure that it doesn't weaken or doesn't introduce some weakness that we don't want to have. So. I think that should be answering your question. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes beyond it. You're, you're not just rejecting backdoors. You're actively working to stop people who might be acting in an underhanded manner, but not obviously about it. Well, we hope to, yeah. Yeah, you hope to, okay. Yeah, so we've never been approached. I've never been approached. And we would never backdoor Subgraph OS. And um, uh, we just learned that about 82% of Subgraph OS packages are reproducible, so we're working to, uh, uh, you know, get to 100% and rely on that as a as a way to, to, to build trust in in our in our project. And would Subgraph also do something similar to Cubes, for example, having a warrant canary, so that this is an ongoing thing where these projects yeah. have the same standard? Yeah, yeah, sure. We because we're a new project, we you know, of course, we're still setting a lot of things up, but yeah. Totally, I think we would be, we, we like the idea. Yeah. And for Tails? So this is a really personal question. I don't think I've ever spoken about this publicly in a, like a public space. But before I worked on Tails, um, we organized, so there's this Dutch hacker camp that happens every four years. And there has been a big investigation going on by the Secret <laughs> Service for, I think, about a year into hacktivists specifically. This has been noted in the yearly report and they harassed me for a pretty long time, including my family. Fuck these guys, by the way. And um, trying to pretend to family that they are friends of mine, trying to get my phone numbers, um, coming to my house, coming, coming to intimidate my family as well by coming to my house, um, and trying to pretend that um, they wanted to, you know, get, uh, you know, um, how, how I could help them uh, with the hacker community. So they specifically asked me to become an informant, and I rejected that. And we should always reject that. Um, so I'm happy that's on camera now. Is that the? Yeah. Awesome. I didn't, I didn't expect to be talking about you. <laughs> um, was, just to clarify so that we can um, put those people a little bit more in the hot seat, that would be mm -hmm. the AIVD intelligence agency in right. the Netherlands? Mm -hmm. Fuck those guys. <clears throat> and I didn't mean to actually ask about you personally. Right. Um, but I think it's important to know that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's really admirable that you would 
actually not only tell that story, but you would turn them down. I know a lot of people that didn't turn them down. Um, we call them intelligence agents. So, um, um, but I actually was hoping to talk about tails. Right. Um, so, as far as I understand, and I speak for myself, I've not been approached um, by whatever kind of agency um, to backdoor the system. Um, I don't know about the others. Um, you know, we do a lot of code reviewing to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, and, you know, that's just a trust thing, uh, right? So, you know, hopefully, you know, together with the Debian Reproducible Build project, we can reach that level. But I don't think it's only that. We should also work towards, like, because we do a lot of testing on our um, end to make sure that we do, like, a quality release, that we should do reproducible tests. Um, because we can do, you know, it's not just a building. We should make sure that everybody who can run some kind of like Tails notary system um, can do the same tests and get the same results. So we make sure that the continuous integration kind of um, like machines don't get compromised in whatever way. Um, and that is something, uh, you know, I hope to, we, we hope to work towards them. So I think it's pretty unified and should be very clear. No backdoors ever. Don't even bother approaching these people. Hopefully everyone will have warrant canaries. Does Tails have a warrant canary? Um, I don't think so at the moment. But okay. We should maybe consider that. Okay. Um, okay. Now, I just, I'm sorry. I'm, I feel I need, I need to make some clarification now. Um, I, we are originally thinking about doing this after the, the, the talk, but... Uh, okay, so we are talking about operating systems here. Uh, cubes, subgraph, tails. They might be the most secure operating systems, and that's really cool. They might not be backdoored because we will all stand not to agree to build backdoors. We might have great isolation technology and exploitation. But, however, this all is actually meaningful if the underlying hardware that we run on will be backdoored. And unfortunately, that's a big challenge because the current hardware that we have is actually untrustworthy, is not trustworthy. There are, and, and the problem is that the trend, if you look at Intel platforms, for example, the trend is that is becoming even less trustworthy with every new release, a new generation of, of processors. That really bothers me. So I just wanted to clarify this, that, that you don't have this notion that you can just use secure operating system and just because we look at the such nice people that won't agree to have any backdoors, that you would be safe. I mean, that might, might just be um, illusion of security. Well, one thing that's worth mentioning, I mean, the, there's a sort of joke in the free software community that Linux security is kind of like a trash fire. And, and I mean, I think that was is accurate, it wasn't even pejorative, and it's like a pretty low-burning trash fire, but when you look at the trash fire, it's actually like a trash fire on, you know, a bombed-out city, and that's the hardware that Joanna's is talking about. Like, Intel, when they say Intel inside, they don't mean intelligence agency inside on purpose, but definitely, that seems to be one of the possibilities. So if you, this is a totally obscure thing, but if you look at a cell phone, most cell phones have a processor inside of them made by, say, the ARM Corporation, which is, uh, in, you know, depending on where it's manufactured, it might be British, it might be, you know, from China or something. And then you have these Intel CPUs made by America, or you have AMD, and you, you, you know, most journalists in the audience, I don't expect you to know the difference between these things. But an important detail is that at the end of the day, whatever software you're using, it runs on hardware. And it's a little bit like you're in that land. You have the rules of the, of the software. They're, they're, they're defined by the hardware they run on. And hardware is this place, uh, essentially, where when you're running the software, you have no visibility into it, no transparency. And free software was a start, but we need to move to a place of free and open hardware. Obviously, we're not going to solve that here today. Um, there are lots of projects out there that try to solve this problem, and no, no one really does except for a project called the Milky Mist which is a video mixer thing, so I don't expect any of you guys to you know, do your investigative journalist on, uh, work on that. Um, but as an example, there are you know, str like great strides towards that. And, and to that end, I know that there are some really, really incredibly badass uh, hardware and software hackers in the audience that want to ask questions. 
And so we have, um, I think, um, um, something like 15 minutes, and then we're going to hopefully have time to do closing statements from each of the project. Is so it okay, if, Jake, that I just gather questions? Well, yeah. what I'd like to do is maybe uh, line up everybody against the wall. Uh, um, <laughs> or along the microphone lines, just so we can actually get an idea of scale. Because if we just go around... Um, so one, yeah, or we just could, gather questions and then you respond? Yeah, let's, yeah we can do that. Um, so I'll take a few questions. Hi. Uh, yes, yeah, so I understand each operating system offers different features to either prevent or limit the damage of um, an exploit. but. Um, do you offer any detection features so that I would actually know if I've opened a dodgy PDF file that has some kind of malicious payload? Um, and what would I have to do in that circumstance to audit my machine or my USB stick to find out if I had been hacked? Okay, so we'll take a few, we'll take a few questions and then we'll just pool them together because I think a few answers will really tie okay. together. Okay, you're gonna write it down. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll summarize. Um, my question goes into the same direction that Joanna raised with um, that the hardware, underlying hardware could be an issue and I wanted to raise the issue, what about the underlying kernel? Because as I understand, all three projects are based on Linux and, yeah. no? On Zen. In Cubes we trust Zen, the hypervisor. We don't trust Linux kernel. Right, but inside the Xen um, machine, there is a, uh, usually a Linux kernel running. Usually, it could be yes. other. But well, anyway, um, um, what I meant is that the sort of an elephant in the room is that uh, the Linux kernel has grown exponentially in, in complexity over the last years. It currently stands at about 16 million lines of, uh, of code, and there's not a single person on this planet that understands all of this uh, complexity. And uh, the other aspect of that is that the general Unix security model has a weak point called the omnipotent root. So like once you're root, you can do basically everything and the kernel is run as root. And so any, any exploit in one of these 16 million lines of code could already trip the whole security. And um, so without going into, into too much detail, I just wanted to um, ask, have there, any, have there been any in your projects any um, efforts to maybe base it on a different kernel, like there's uh, BSD kernels, there are new projects coming out. Uh, why does it always have to be Linux? Um, just wanted to bring that. So I'm, I'm collecting. Do you want me to take this? No, 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 I'm collecting a few, okay. and then we'll, we'll pull them together. Hi, I'd like to ask, what is a warrant canary, and do I need one? Okay. Google. Uh, my question is, um, what, uh, what are the uh, uh, obstacles to um, running uh, Subgraph with, a, uh, with the GRSec kernel uh, on cubes? Uh, why, why is that not uh, doable already, and sure. will it be soon? Yes. Okay, well, I, I think we have a, a, a few, we have a few questions here, so let's, let's just, pa let's pause for a second and then, and switch it up. Let's start with the easy one of what's a warrant canary. Um, do you want to describe a warrant canary since you don't have one for Tails? <laughs> <laughs> right. Could you tell us why we might want one for Tails? <laughs> <laughs> nice one. So, um, basically what a warrant canary will be is that you, you publish a statement and you sign that statement with, ideally, um, like a PGP key, and you say, you know, I haven't been um, asked by any intelligence agency or any other kind of agency or police and law enforcement to play some backdoor or, you know, compromise in whatever way, um, you know, the system or you as a person, um, and you, you know, you Periodical, the uh, period, yeah. periodically, exactly. Um, you know, maybe every three months, maybe every six months, maybe every year, you publish the same. You publish the statement, and when something happens, you could either stop publishing a statement, or you can leave out a certain thing that might have happened to you, right? Um, does that answer your question? Oh. It's 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 a way to signal. Ah, okay, so there are two things that are going on here. One is you have some root of trust where you have some way to know that you really are getting a statement from someone. Like you meet them in person and they swear to you on this stage that they haven't been approached. So that's, that's a kind of thing. The purpose of the canary is essentially, as he says, to do this on a regular basis electronically. 
And why you should believe it is because you ever believed them in the first place. And the, the theory, the legal theory, effectively, is non-existent for these things. Um, but the idea is that you can't be forced, you can't, be, you can't have compelled speech to say that there's no back door if, in fact, there now is a back door. And that's the theory, and I think it'll work exactly once, um, but maybe it'll work once per country, it's not clear. And so that's, that's sort of why you might want to have one. But obviously, if you don't trust anybody from the very beginning, it's like we said, it's a, you know, Linux is a trash fire, and so security and, and these warrant canaries are pretty similar in that you, know, you start with a not great environment and then you're doing the best that you possibly can. But it's still important because if you find people that aren't willing to make such a statement at all, you have to wonder if they would bother to tell you if something has gone wrong. Now obviously all of these projects, even if they don't have a warrant canary, that, that's, they're still making that statement, right? There's just ways to improve the automation of verifying this kind of thing so, so, so they can send up a flag for people to go looking and to understand. Um, the, the really scary thing about warrant canaries in the so-called free west is that probably, especially with the Apple FBI case right now, the FBI would argue that it's obstruction of justice if you don't continue to put out a warrant canary even if it's a lie. And that battle right now is about compelled speech and one part of it. And so warrant canaries are important, especially if we win the battle to not have to sign things that are under coercive uh, force. And so that's why warrant canaries are important. That's why hopefully Tails will implement one soon and so on and subgraph. That's that, I would say. Shall we do the other questions? Well, we have, a, we have one for cubes, which I think is really an important delineation, um, which is what about other kernels and what about hypervisors? And that also sort of extends into how do we get subgraph OS to run inside of cubes? Right, uh, so the question you ask about the monolithic Linux kernel, that's, again, one of the very reasons we decided to use this full-blown virtualization because we never liked the Linux kernel. We still use it in VMs, but the way we use it, the way we think about Linux kernel is it's a provider of APIs and drivers. But even if it has bugs, so it might have it. The, the architecture of the OS makes it that even if the attacker exploits one of the many bugs, which surely are in Linux kernel, nothing wrong happens. And somebody asked about detection also. We don't, we don't have a uh, detection mechanism uh, in cubes right now, but you should think about cubes more as a platform. So you can build one. Uh, we, we provide infrastructure for uh, inter-VM, inter-compartment communication, which could be used for that, perhaps. Uh, that's. No, I mean, I, I guess a, another question is, wouldn't it be possible to use some of the unikernel tools that are being built of course, yeah. inside of cubes? I mean, is that a strength of cubes that you think you There are actually already some, some, some community contributions of people contributing uh, uh, what is called unikernels, uh, uh, which are very small kernels built for special purpose. So in the future, we can imagine having uh, a PDF viewer with its own little kernel or maybe a networking driver with uh, networking kernel for networking cards uh, with just essential pieces which would be maybe 100 times less. This is not so important for cubes to trust it because as I said we don't trust anyway. Uh, it's more important as a way of minimizing uh, resource usage. Okay. And about subgraph OS, I mean, could you yeah. speak to why running on bare metal versus in a hypervisor, like what the differences are? Is there something that we should be considering? Well, um, I think that there are, there are, there are advantages to Joanna's approach. There are, it's not as ideal as, um, as, as it may seem. I mean, we want the exploit not to work in the first place. Even when you have multiple VMs running on the same processor, there are things like side channel attacks where information can leak uh, through the CPU cache from one VM to potentially another. Uh, but I want to address the questions um, on, on detection and the Linux kernel. So we acknowledge the Linux kernel is massively complex. Uh, for the applications that are sandboxed in subgraph OS, I'll use the Koi instant messenger as an example. There are 330 or so entry points into the kernel um, for an application uh, on Linux on x86-64, roundabout thereabouts. We do some profiling in Subgraph OS for each application. 
to find out exactly which entry points they need. And then we use a Linux kernel feature called SecComp BPF to reduce the exposure of the kernel, to minimize the paths to exploiting the kernel, to cut off as many of those vulnerabilities as we can. We also, we make it we make also, it su we also provide a, a reduced kernel with, uh, with Subgraph OS. And I just want to spend one minute or so talking about detection. Detection is something that's important. Um, right now, uh, there is a security company, if, if I can call them that, an anti-security company, that has a price list for vulnerabilities uh, that they're, they're willing to pay for exploits that people have. And guess who's on that list? It's Tails. It's Tor Browser. So, so these, these vulnerabilities are being actively sought out. We, we are targeted. The users of Tails and Tor Browser are targeted. Um, but the important thing is that these, these vulnerabilities have a cost. And today, if an attacker deploys an exploit, there's very little risk that if the exploit fails, that, that they'll lose their investment. Because the exploit just gets fired off at the target, and if it doesn't work, nobody sees that happening. With Subgraph OS, we're building something called Harvester, which attempts to capture failed exploit attempts. Um, and, then, and this introduces the risk to the adversary that their investment gets lost. So they have to adjust their deployment calculus. Um, and this increases security for all of us. So this is a very, detection is a very important part of what Subgraph OS is doing. And you can see a little bit of that if you like open the GNOME calculator. If you try Subgraph OS, just try it, it just works. You open the GNOME calculator, you'll get a firewall pop up that says this calculator tried to connect to some IMF website. Um, so detection is super important for us. I'm glad someone asked about that. Can we have two more questions, last questions, and so, then we all oh, get coffee? Over here in the front, Peter. Well, if, if there are also can... two questions here. Yeah, but first, this guy. This guy is the most okay. important questioner in the room, uh, and he's going to fuck up everyone's day. OK. So. I was warned by him. Thank you for working on, on secure software. That's, that's very important. Um, I have a, uh, I, I could ask several questions. I'll just stick with the most general one. What are your respective projects doing to avoid that your users have a false sense of security? That's a Take the other two questions too. This is resonate yeah. with this one. And then what we'll do, what we'll do after this. Uh, my question almost ties in with that one, uh, and that is the user interface. How user-friendly are your operating systems? How complicated are they for the operator? Because that's where the next failure happens, even with Tor. Uh, if you fail to turn off at the right stage and you, can, uh, you uh, are exposed immediately, there can conceivably be a failure because of a failure of operation by the operator. So. Uh, how intuitive, how counterintuitive, how complicated is it for the user? Thank you. Take last, question. last question is here. Please stand up. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, um, I have a rather political question than a technological question. Um, what I encounter in software developing is that um, usually the, the, the developers develop by themselves and uh, political processes uh, missing, like uh, integrating people into the um, software development process, um, seeing what the other requirements are, testing with them together. So um, speaking, for example, about Tails and the underlying um, de um, operating system, it's called Debian, which is the universal operating system, as they stated themselves. And I wonder, okay, um, we have here an audience of investigative journalists, and um, they have special, really special requirements. I mean, I've worked together with uh, some guy um, at a conference, and if he would have used Tails, uh, um, um, he, he, I don't know what would have happened, uh, but one time, uh, one moment, he was um, sharing information with others and put, um, plugging in his uh, another USB stick into his computer. So, is this case use case also uh, handled in the threat models and so on? So, I would like to know: um, Is it only value-based your software um, uh, development model, or? Do you also think that it's important to integrate people uh, into this process? 
Great. Are there, are there any other questions? Is this will be the final chance? That any burning questions? I think there it is. this guy and then maybe. Yeah, then also the Care Bear. Okay. okay. Well, um, I would like to talk about funding um, because um, the, the basic idea was wouldn't it be great if everybody could contribute and we do crowdfunding and you, you were not reliant on US uh, government money? Has it ever occurred to you that it might be a problem of communication? Um, I think lots of people would be willing to contribute to your project if you could communicate and tell me what they actually do, what I should, what I should do. I'm one of these um, dumbass journalists here who doesn't understand the word of what you're saying, basically. I'm an investigative journalist. I'm being laughed at because I'm using Apple products. I've been offered, I don't know, 15, 25 different solutions for problems I'm not having. Um, Outside. So the basic question is: Isn't this? Isn't it? Isn't it an island discussion you've, you're leading? Um, I know many colleagues who would contribute to your projects if you just could communicate to me and tell me that's what you need. And um, yes. Thank you. Great. I can take this guy. Uh -huh. I can take. Just for, every, just for everyone to realize, uh, we are now in our coffee break, so the longer we talk, the less coffee you have. Yeah. Okay, yes. so the final question from, yeah? All right. Um, yes, hardware is a big problem. You mentioned that. It's important that we work on that, too. Mm, specifically, I want to ask about a feature I saw in the subgraph email client, which is the centralized PGP key server. Uh, if I understood what I read correctly, then this key server would see a request from every subgraph user receiving an encrypted or signed email in order to verify the, the sender's um, public key, so to, to help with the cryptography. Um, I, 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 it feels like in, this, in the tech community we've talked about centralized services and how they are not such a good idea, so, um, yeah. so what's up with that? So your question, just to clarify, is about NIMS and the, S, the subgraph mail client. Okay, great. So we have a few, we have a few questions here, and we'll just, uh, hopefully we can start actually. Um, can you do it in like two minutes? You know, <laughs> I, let me check. N no. We are, okay. at two, uh, we are at 11.15 now. Yeah. Let's, let's okay. start with, with this. Uh, yeah, so I'd question. like to start with the, with, the, with the funding question. And from, from the funding question, I, I wonder if you guys could each give an ask to this community. Let's say someone in this community is a multimillionaire who wants to sponsor you and they're not from the US government. Um, what are some things, specifically reaching out to this person in the back about funding? How is it that people could help? What are the things that need to be done? How much money are we talking about to do these things? Now, actually, I, I wanted to, I, if I understood you correctly, you did not understand the problems we're trying to solve, is that what you ask? So the simple answer to your, problem, to your question is that we're trying to make personal computing devices secure and trustworthy. Why the hell would anybody want to have a secure and trustworthy personal device, you might think now? Well, just because we people are actually moving our lives to those personal devices. These are becoming extension of our brains. So, uh, at least for me, it feels somehow uncomfortable that my extension of my brain might not be trustworthy, that it might be spying on me, conspiring against me. So, that's just the problem I'm trying to solve. Does it sound more familiar to you now? I understand the general problem. I'm not that dumb. Okay. See, the, the problem, sure. The problem is that if you are a non-technical person, we can, ha all of us can tell you our solution is the best. At the end of the day, you have no means of judging yourself because you don't understand the technology architecture. You can just judge whether I speak more fluently or maybe David speaks more fluently. Maybe he's a nicer guy because he tells more jokes and maybe I have bad looks or maybe Yura is somehow, I don't know, appealing, you know? What I'm trying to say is just, sorry, you, you, you don't have means if you don't understand technology to, to judge which of these 25 you said, but they're not really 25. They're less, but still. Okay. 
finish. Sorry. Do you want to save that one? I think you can also yeah. maybe go to the crypto bar and talk to more yeah. people there. Yeah? That's also a great solution. So, um, fortunately, we have a large community of experts in the open source and free software world. And um, there's a lot of great just sort of natural selection that happens. And, and the projects that are here today are here for a reason. T Tails is, is tried and true for many years. Cubes is tried and true for many years. And, and we are longtime security people. And ultimately, this is how we, how we make decisions about all things. So my recommendation to you is to try, try them. Spend a weekend. And if you feel you need one of these solutions, invest the time in a weekend and, and grab Subgraph OS and try it on your laptop and, and see if you like it. So I'd, I'd like to skip, no, just so that can... Carolyn stops having an aneurysm, I'd like to skip just straight up to uh, the... I think maybe people who want to go to coffee, you're allowed to go, and then you can talk on till the next panel starts. That's fine, too. Okay. Yeah, There's just, yeah so just go, and then we go on. <laughs> There's one... Yeah. So I just wanted to address the question Peter asked, because it was a very important question. Let's wait. wait question. Let's let people leave, if they want to leave. So if you want to get a coffee, go on. Okay. We won't take it badly. Yeah. And if I you think want that's to stay. Good. And then you just can't go on another 10 yeah. minutes. I got yeah, my do that? Go for coffee if you like, and yeah. they can go on another 10 minutes. And maybe if you want to talk, maybe you come closer, that it can be a, more a conversation. Great. Everybody take note of the people leaving. Those are the ones that uh, <laughs> might need these solutions. You should buddy up with them and become friends. Yeah. I, I'd like to switch also to a, a topic which I think we, really shows a strength of the Tails project that I think is extremely important which actually benefits all three of the projects, which is the question about political integration. Uh, by basing the, each of these solutions on, on free software projects that already exist, especially with regard to reproducible builds, which is a project of some people in this room, um, the political integration of different operating systems, such as the Debian GNU Linux universal operating system, is a really interesting topic. It's very different than if you're used to paying for proprietary software from Microsoft, for example. The gating factor for being able to get code into Microsoft is if you have a good resume and you have a good reference, which, by the way, if you worked for the NSA, you're basically guaranteed a job at Microsoft. And that's very different than in the free software community in, in a lot of ways. So I wonder if you could talk to, to that question about political integration and, and sort of the basis of mm. these, the ways that you guys are cooperating, right? And what do you build from? Um, how do you integrate people into working on your projects? What's your plan for the future? Right. So when people contribute to you know, the operating systems that, are, that have been around for a very long time and, and have been free and have been used by actually most of the you know, reasonably secure operating systems that are still out there, um, you know, Subgraph and, and Tails and Frypto and, uh, like the, and like the Unix projects. Um, when you contribute to a free software project like Debian, all of us benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So when you get a specific package, like a, a particular kind of software like OnionShare, for example, for Michael Lee from The Intercept, um, and that gets into Debian, Tails doesn't only benefit, but Subgraph also benefits, and a lot of other free, um, uh, and the people who just run the Debian project in itself. And this is the way I think how a lot of the developer com community can help, because Tails is a result, like we stand on the shoulder of giants, so, like, so to speak, right? Um, and um, uh, without Debian, there would be no Tails. Um, this is, I think, an absolute fact. Um, and then next to that, it's not only the developers, but we try to, you know, I mean, I hope you know, people are using Tails and they've checked out the website and the documentation and also the translations of the website, for example, is that we try to get as much and diverse people involved as possible. Um, whether that's translators, whether that's people who write documentation or people who just write code. And I think this is, you know, we need all these people to make a fantastic project. Um, can I address the PGP? Because that, that was asked specifically of Subgraph. So. Yeah, if you'd like to. Sure, really quickly. So the GPG key server that you're mentioning, first of all, it, it doesn't exist, and neither does Subgraph Mail, because we, we got funding specifically for Subgraph OS development, so the mail project's on hold. But the thing you're asking about is a protocol we developed called NIMSIO, uh, or NIMS, and it's at, there's a specification online at NIMS.io. I recommend you read it. 
It's not cent it's it's centralized with with um, it's it's an it's a centralized authority with distributed trust. It's modeled on Tor actually, uh, so it's actually not as centralized perhaps as you think. But I recommend you read it and give us your opinion. I'd really like to hear it. So. Yeah. I think, so at this point, I think Carolyn did have an, uh, an aneurysm, so I want to respect that so we can sort of clear the house a bit. I can I, I, to the can I just Whoa. respond to one more question? <laughs> I'd really like to actually give each of the projects, and I'll give you the closing note on this. Okay. So you can answer this question, but after you're done answering the question, I'd really like it if, if you could start, and then we could go down mm -hmm. the line to be able to make closing statements. Okay, I can just skip People this. People need to re-up their just, drugs. We have to respect that. I can just yeah. do the closing statement. Okay, cool. So, um, so these are the closing statements, right? Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, tales. You know, so we got funding, and we are trying to crowdfund something. And indeed, this might actually be a communication problem on our end, and we hope to address that thing. Um, and we kind of figure out, you know, what is the baseline cost in order to survive for a project like Tails. And we figured out that it's about, you know, uh, like $120,000 um, budget a year. And that is kind of like on a, on a shoestring. Ideally, we'd like to have $240,000 a year, um, which we are able to actually like meet in person and do more work together and, you know, pay for server costs and, 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 and pay people like a recent amount of salary and then, you know, maybe even hire consultants to, you know, work on stuff like that. Um, and we kind of established, you know, we all come together every year um, somewhere um, and like secretly all together and we have a Tails Developer Summit where we kind of, you know, make the roadmap for next year. So we made the roadmap last year for this year and it's online and we always really like to hear from the people who have been using the you know, the software, what is it that you're missing? How, how can we make Tails better? Um, and if, can we make Tails better by, you know, making Debian better so we all benefit from the same solutions that, that are out there? And I think this is actually something, you know, we should stress because we did a lot of talking and we created, you know, a kind of forum, um, you know, for operating systems on, it's like a mailing list. That's yeah. something how developers communicate because they love mailing lists. Um, which is great, because we hope to work together, because there's a lot of room for collaboration. Some of the solutions we're looking for are, we've been looking for like independently, while we benefit if we all look at them together and see how our use cases you know, um, uh, are kind of similar and make, you know, solve these problems. Um, so I think for the future, I hope to do, I hope to see a lot of collaboration and I hope to you know, maybe sit down for a week at some point and like, do epic stuff so we can make these things better and beat the fascists. Okay, so I'll, tr I'll keep my closing statement ultra short. I want to address uh, what I thought was the most important question that was asked here. Uh, we didn't talk about it. It's, uh, he's in a conversation right now. But, but the question was about how easy are these solutions to use. So usability, uh, being able to just plug it in, install it, use it, and keep your workflows that you're used to, this is as important an objective to subgraph as security is. Uh, and I recommend that today, I think it's pretty usable. It's going to get better. Try it. Tell us what you think sucks and uh, what we can improve. And we, and we will take this extremely seriously because we want you guys to be able to use subgraph to do your job without it being awkward and absurd. Uh, so that's it. Great. And I think actually the most important question asked was, uh, about what do we do to make sure the users don't have false sense of security here. Um, because if you, if you look at us, we are becoming so addicted to personal computers, and, and yet perhaps selling people, pitching people the, the idea that we can make these devices, personal, dev personal computing devices, laptops or phones, secure and trustworthy, maybe Maybe we will never get there. All our projects are just software projects, and we're struggling, struggling with, with getting funding. And there is no single fully open, open hardware, open source hardware project for actual hardware. And as we established, there is no way of having trustworthy personal computing without trustworthy hardware. So perhaps all this, what we are doing here, 
maybe it's just meaningless. Because no. maybe we will never be able to catch up. <laughs> I think we have some dissent. Maybe, maybe, we will never, maybe we will never be able to catch up with, say, Intel, if we wanted to do, like, open source <laughs> processor. Maybe we will never even be able, even if we wanted Intel, if maybe we can't even design a laptop with open source other hardware. We will always be behind, and people will never uh, really be able to trust personal okay, computing okay, devices. Okay. Maybe we should rethink yeah. our attitude okay. to personal computers. <laughs> Restrain yourself. <laughs> Restrain yourself. Um, could you make a, a closing statement about the Cubes project and the future of the Cubes project beyond the security nihilism? Because I, I actually have a lot of hope. The, you know, the three of you guys, I'm sorry, you know, I'm not going to make a closing well, statement as for, about as it. For, as for operating system, um, <laughs> as for Cubes OS, I think the future is for our projects to just cooperate. Um, we can have subgraph template running on Cubes OS. That makes lots of sense. It should be a no-brainer. Uh, we like also can use some uh, infrastructure from Tails and the experience with making things easy and, mm -hmm. like, trainings and stuff. So I, I see no brainer for, uh, for all of us to cooperate because there is really, I think, no space for three niche exotic secure operating systems because we are not really competing with each other. We are competing with OS X or Windows. Yep. So as for operating systems, if we think this is the right way to go, then the only way probably is to Join forces. So you'd say then all three of you would agree that the correct answer is cooperation in the future. Some mutual aid and solidarity between your projects to be able to integrate and to be able to share all of the work that you're doing. Well, yeah, that is the ethos of the free software world we come from. So. Okay. Well, great. On that note, um, it's not my revolution if I can't wear a silly hat. And so I'm really looking forward to collaborating in the future and seeing this. And as a user of all three of your projects, I think it's really an honor to have shared the stage with you. And I think that there are a lot of people here that have a lot of questions. And I'm hopeful that we can go down to the crypto bar and uh, drink some coffee along the way. And then we can continue this discussion. And users can actually install all of these projects today, potentially, if you brought a computer and really actually start to use them. And also, if you're a technical person who's interested, to get involved. And I really hope that if you have a dump truck full of money, that you deliver it to each of these projects. Because there's almost no one on your side, but these ones are on your side. So thank you very much. Yeah,